now that we have the, the kind of main menu part working and tested and we know that the program quits when the user enters choice three and they can only enter valid choices, we need to start um, with the start quiz function. We could display the leaderboard equally or do the, the add student, but it just makes sense to do the start quiz function. So if we look up for where the procedure is declared for start quiz, you can see that it has the print start quiz line to test that it was working. So I'm just going to go ahead and code that out and we'll, we'll work through each line and discuss and talk about what it is. So again, a user variable, uh, a local variable, sorry, to store the username, which we'll initialize um, to blank, and in fact I've just done that in the wrong place. Um, so it's username equal to blank, and what I wanted to initialize here was the user score initialized to zero, obviously set to zero, because when you start a quiz I guess you have zero uh, marks correct. Now if you're not familiar with the, the read, the file read part, just work through this slowly and try and understand it. So what we're going to do is create a brand new connection to a file and we're going to use the open command and tell it the name of the file we wish to open. So the one that contains our questions is this socrative.csv and the second parameter that this function needs is the type that's going to open. So what this really says is create a, a connection to this file called Socrative in read-only mode and we're going to refer to it as file. Very straightforward. The next thing we need to do is get the raw data from that file, so be careful with the indentation, there's something not working quite right with mines. So I, was, I always just say uh, raw data equals the file dot read lines and it'll literally read every line in until it gets to the end of the file and um, save that as raw data. So just as a quick test so you can see what that looks like, I'm going to print that out. So print raw data. I'm just going to get rid of it as quickly as I've got it. I'll just like to test that the file reading is working. So if we enter choice one, you can see that it literally just dumps all of the, the, the raw data, as we've called it, onto the screen. Um, now I'll take that out. The next thing we always have to make sure we do with our files is make sure that we close them. So we need to do file.close just so that if you try and open the file again there's not already a connection open to it so it can cause some interesting errors. Now that's file reading, three lines to read a file. What the tricky part is actually storing the information in the correct places. So we need arrays for each of the columns we looked at in the first part. So if you remember, and we can have a look at it, if it's still open. Uh, so let's look at the Socrative file. We've got a column for questions, four columns for answers, and one column for the correct answer. So I'll close that down and it will normally ask me to save or not. So we need an array to store the questions, which we're going to declare to a blank array. We need the answer one column, which is the potential answer one. Same for answer two. Same for answer three. Same for answer four. All blank arrays, and then we need the correct answer also an array. So we've got the six arrays that require there. You can see there's a little note to say six arrays. Now eventually we're going to create a record structure to do this because this is not the best way um, to store it. Six different arrays doesn't really help when it comes to sorting um, as if you had six arrays we'd have to do six different swaps, lots of code instead of just one if we had a data structure. So now the part to split up all of the CSV file into different arrays. So we have to loop for all of the lines in raw data. So we're going to do for index and range the length of the raw data, which is just a list itself. 
So that'll take one line at a time. So let's just do a test so we can see what that looks like. So if we print, uh, and we can't print it just yet, sorry, um, after we split it. So I like to use split data as my variable equals the raw data. And because it's a list, if we inspect the index position at it, that will take one line at a time. We want to then split on the character of comma, because that's what a CSV file is, comma separated values. Now if we test what that looks like, what that looks like, and we print out the split data, it starts to look a bit more structured. So if we call start quiz, you can see now instead of <clears throat> one big dump of all the information, we have separate smaller lists now. And you can see these commas here being used to divide up the different questions and answers. So we're getting closer. So I'll delete that. Now, the next one is, again, lots of code that could be um, simplified if we had record structures. So what we want to do is the questions array, we want to append, we want to add the first item from split data. So we want to append split data at index position 0. And I always add dot strip at the end because it tears off any um, non-displayed ASCII characters. So, for example, return statements. So it's a good habit to do that. Now, hopefully you can figure out that we could just cheat a little and say answers one dot append the first item and split data. And hopefully you can see that there's a pattern going to emerge that answers two. We're going to append the item index two. The third is going to be split data three. And answers four is going to be split data four. And not split data five, but the correct answer is what is ever at position 5 in the list. And again, just stripping them all down. Now, I want to just test that that worked. So I will print out, and not inside the loop here, I will print uh, the questions array just to test that it's working. So if we run it again, enter choice 1, and we can see answers one is not defined. Now that is because we've called the array answer. So we can either change this part of it and just check the rest of them, um, or I could have changed the actual name of them. So it was worthwhile testing that now before we add any other code. So you can see here that it's printing out the different questions. So it looks to be the questions, and we'll just print out the correct answer and run that, and we'll just test that it's printed at numbers, that looks fine. Now, an important thing to remember right now is that those comments, or sorry, those um, apostrophes here indicate that those that's saved as a string. So when we need to manipulate it later, we've got to change it to an integer. So right now I'm going to delete that print because I think that that seems to be correct. Now, our quiz is going to um, ask 10 questions every time, 10 random questions. Now, you can add more questions in to make it better. So I'm going to, going to use the same idea of the loop again for index in range starting at 0, terminate at 10. So that's going to execute from 0 to 9. Now, we're going to get an error in a second when I try to use this, um, this random uh, variable. So if I make random q, now I technically I'm cheating a little, I haven't actually declared that variable. We want to use the rand int function. We want to pick from question 0 all the way to the length of however many questions there are. Now we've got to be careful there because the length of questions would go up to 10, but the index position is 9, so we need to actually subtract 1 from that to ensure that it doesn't 
give us an index out of bounds exception. So I'm going to run that so you can see that there might be a, an error when we try to use the rand function. So you can see rand int is not defined. So to fix that, if you look at the top, there's an import statement. So up at the very beginning, next to the comments from random import star, just to import all of them. Uh, it's overkill, we could just import rand int, but I'm just doing the star just to make it easy for me. So if we press one, you can see that that error is now gone. And it's displaying nothing yet because we haven't actually told it to display anything in our quiz. So now we can display a random question. So we have a random integer. So we can literally print whatever question is in the array at that random position. So if we test this now, and choose start the quiz, um, you can see that I've got an error and the reason for that is it's not called question, it's called questions. So if we fix that little piece there uh, and run it, hopefully this time, choice one, you can see that 10 different questions appear there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Some of them appeared twice, and that's just because I don't have a lot of questions, really. Now, the next part we want to do is to display the potential answers, and we want to want to display them um, in a neat way. So I'm going to do print uh, the number 1, so they know this is response 1, and that will be answer 1 at the exact same random position as the question came from. And again, similarly, we can cheat because I want to display the number 2 and whatever the second potential answer is. And then the same for answer 3. And the same for answer 4. And if we run that, this time, if we enter choice 1, you can see that it's now displaying the potential answers to. So we could display it a little bit better maybe if we go back here and add in a tab just so it displays over a little bit. And keep up the blank lines to keep your readability high and then just throw in a print to print a blank line to split up the display to make it look a bit more readable. So you can see here so we've got a nice blank line appearing between the questions and we have the answers appearing. So next for us is to get an integer as the answer from the keyboard, also validated. So it hasn't um, given you all of the lines for that. So hopefully at the top we can see that we have, uh, or we don't have a variable for this, so we should probably put one up there at the end, user answer equals int and put enter choice one to four for your answer. answer. And we want to make sure we have the correct number of brackets. And then we're going to say well user answer is less than one or user answer is greater than four, then we're going to say invalid choice. Enter choice 1 to the 4 for your answer. So that will now validate it. So if we run it again now and run the quiz, now it's going to ask me for my answer each time. So I'm just going to type 1 quickly for each of these to test that it works. Let's try a 5. You can see that my validation is working. Just test that the other numbers work. And it looks to be working fine and the terminate part still working, which is great. Now, when the user picks their answer, they are entering 1, 2, 3, and 4, but our answers are 0, 1, 2, and 3. So what we're going to have to do is set the user answer equal to the user answer minus 1, so that it's in the same range of numbers from 0 to 3, rather than uh, 1 to 4. Now, you can see I've accidentally put that in the wrong place again there, so be careful. Should be here. 
And now we want to check if the user answer is correct. So if user answer equals what? Where are the answers saved? Well, the answers are saved in the correct answer array. But then we can't have this. We can't say if the user answer equals the full array. We need to have one certain position right now. Now, the position we want to check is the same as where the answers and the questions come from is random Q position. Now, if you remember earlier, we said that this is a string. User answer is an integer. So we've got to then cast the random question, or sorry, the correct answer at random question position to an integer. Now, if that's true, that means the user has got it correctly. So we can say user score equals the user score plus one. And we'll tell them they were correct. So print correct. Otherwise, if it doesn't match, we can tell them they were wrong. Print incorrect. And we may want to tidy this up with some um, blank lines eventually. Now, you can see end if Python has no code and end loop. I've put them in just because we should. It's good um, readability to show where the loops end and also for us to fix our indentation. So after that loop terminates, the quiz is over. So we would want to um, tell them that it's finished so we can print uh congratulations you scored in space comma and display the user score yeah so let's test that that part's all working uh so i've messed up indentation here somehow let's see what's going wrong here and it's a tiny little space there for some reason but to make sure um that the, that the spaces aren't extra, otherwise it doesn't work, breaking this, the rules of the program. So start the quiz. A processor speed is measured in hertz. RAM is 2. So I'm not going to guess for these 3, 2, 3, 4. Check my validation's working. 4, 3, 1, 1. So you can see, get the, the message telling us we're correct or incorrect. We have, congratulations, you've scored 4. And you can see then that the menu appears again, so we could tidy this up later so the output's a bit better. Now, after the user um, completes the quiz, we want to get their name so we can store their score into our uh, leaderboard file. So username equals input, and we'll say, please enter your name for the leaderboard. And I know that will work. Now, this part here, the call procedure is going to be the start of the next part. So get the actual quiz part working before you continue on with the next part of the code.